and welcome to the Prairie Fiber Witch podcast. Uh, I'm Sarah, uh, coming to you from Edmonton, Alberta in the Canadian prairies. Um, this is my little bit of YouTube where I talk about my crafting, um, which is mostly knitting, but I do um, do other crafts as well, such as cross stitch. Um, I'm sort of getting my toes dipped in weaving. I spin other things as well. Um, this week is primarily knitting and, um, oh, a anything that I talk about, I try to put, um, pertinent information, uh, in the description box, which can be found. There's like a little arrow that you can expand and find it down there. Um, and if there's, I often link to my Ravelry projects or I try to link to patterns elsewhere for people who can't access Ravelry right now. Um, you can find me on Instagram also as Prairie Fiber Witch or on Ravelry as Jane Mumbles. And yeah, I talked about this, What I'll talk about what I'm wearing. I talked about this sweater uh, on my last podcast and then like that same day I finished knitting it and blocked it and yeah so then I've been wearing this pretty much steadily since then um this is the Osprey pullover um which is a pattern by Jacqueline Seaslack that I've been test knitting I'll put in a little video so you can sort of see a full view of it on my body Um, and I, I mean, this was a test knit, so I was like trying to be dedicated and finish it in a quick amount of time. Um, but I also like was having a lot of like really enjoying brioche at that time, which this is a half brioche stitch pattern in this sweater. Um, so I, yeah, I was really enjoying it and, um. Uh, yeah, just powered through. Um, yeah, I mean, it kind of, well, I mean, so I like, I had, I showed off last time that I had finished a cardigan and then I also like almost immediately finished this sweater too. Um, and maybe it seems like I finished things really quickly. Um, but, uh, I knit a lot. I knit a lot. And so, I mean, I'm a kind of a quick knitter, but I also like in the evenings, if I'm sitting down in front of the TV, I'm just, I'm knitting that whole time. If I'm not knitting, I like just fall, in, fall asleep in front of the TV, whatever we're watching. So um, I should talk about the yarn. This sweater um, is knit out of Custom Woolen Mills, which is a yarn company here in Alberta. Um, and this is their two ply sock yarn and it is a, uh, wool nylon blend. Uh, and I believe they use a blend of, um, uh, sort of Western Canadian Merino and Rambule breeds of sheep. So, I mean, with the title of Merino is, you would think that it's a very soft wool. It's not... I don't like uh, rustic is an inter like an interesting term. Um, I like to think of them as like crunchy because wool has this nice crunch when it's not super wash treated and um I mean it's not it's not your typical super wash merino. Um it is uh sort of a harder yarn. Uh but yeah. I don't know. I don't find it prickly. I, I'm, I think I'm getting used to a sort of the wool prickle, the real wool prickle. I don't know. It's a rougher yarn. Um, but I still really like this sweater and it is, I mean, I have worn it a lot and I think you can kind of see it's starting to pill a little, but I really don't mind. 
Um, I like this yarn. I like that I got it, that it's sort of a local to me yarn and that um, it's not terribly expensive either. So uh, yeah. And you'll probably see like, um, I can't link to the pattern on uh, Jack Jackie's uh, website just yet because it's not posted. Uh, but she always does a roundup of all the test knitter versions on her blog. Uh, so you can see all the different variety of sweaters that people have made with a whole different slew of yarns um, at different price points. So like there's some, um, some made with like lovely hand dyed yarn, which are gorgeous. There are, I think somebody even knit like a linen version. Um... Yeah, so it it is a nice sweater. And this, I find my version is like a nice, cozy kind of slightly dressed up um, like sweatshirt. That's kind of how I'm feeling it. And like, I don't mind, I wore this on the weekend when we went out to the lake to take in the garden. So I didn't mind, I didn't feel it was so precious to like not be using it to do yard work. So, yeah, I might make another one of these in the future. I'm not sure yet. And so far, I'm just really enjoying this one. Um, Next, what have I finished? I only, like, this is my only other finished thing. And I it was, like, sitting finished for a little bit on my desk, just needing the ends to be woven in. And these are my, what I'm calling my Noro... Uh, sock tube socks. So uh, just a reminder with these, I had made another pair of stripey Noro socks where I was taking one skein of Noro and striping from um, stri using both ends of the ball to to create these stripes uh, from the inside and the outside of the skein. And um, after making one pair of socks as in it along with a friend, I decided to just make a tube with whatever I had left over. Um, and then I'm I used that tube to sort of test out the like sock machine kind of construction that a lot of people do who have circular sock machines, which is they take a tube, they divide it in half, um, add toes and cuffs and heels uh, to each one using like the after the thought heel method. And um, so that's what I did here. I when I got to the end of my tube, I added a toe. Um, and then at the other end of the tube, I added the cuff. And then I carefully counted how many stripes that I had. And um, I had an even number of stripes, so I was able to divide between two stripes. And it just so happened that like, not all of my, I do four row stripes for these. Um, but every once in a while I did do like a, f a fifth row stripe and it just so happened that I had a fifth row on the stripe that I was dividing the sock at, which is very lucky and not planned at all. So then my stripes are actually pretty even. Um, I did have to, uh, because I am striping like basically two yarns together, um, I did have to, like, I had to take out an entire round to divide the two halves of the sock. And then I had the little, um, I was carrying the yarn up the side, so I had to unravel about a quarter of a round um, of the other part of the sock. I don't know, was it there? Yeah, I think it was here. Um, I think it was here. There was like a, a, a quarter round that I had to, um, unravel a bit more so that I would have enough of a tail to be able to weave in on either sock, which I mean, I like, I suppose if I counted and I really looked, I could find it again, but um, that's, yeah, it's really not that noticeable, especially since this, the, I decided to do the cuff in kind of a similar color, so they just kind of bleed into each other nicely. Um, and these, what I used for the, uh, so I was using a skein of Noro Teo sock that I had in my stash um, that I had in my stash for a few years that I had intended for a different project but that never happened so now they're socks um, and then these other colors that I used um, for the the contrasting heels toes and cuffs 
um, are a couple of balls, 50 gram balls of classic elite summer socks that I had bought to make some summer socks for myself um, many years ago, but never did. Um, the atten My intention was to make striped socks, so um, with these two colors, and then, um, yeah, I might still make them at some point um, when I feel like making some more striped socks. I'm a big fan of striping in general. When, um, when I was a young knitter, like I learned to knit when I was six or seven or so. And when I figured out that like basically creating sti stripes is just like starting a row with a different color and that you could carry the yarn up the side of something, I made like everything striped. I was really into knitting my own mittens. I had, um, I sort of taught myself to knit based on following patterns that I found lying around and my mom had a lot of patents booklets and one was for mittens. So I, I used to use that mitten pattern a lot to like make myself mittens for winter. And uh, yeah, so once I figured out striping, like I would always make striped mittens. So striping, I have a long history of enjoying striping, manual striping, and more recently, like once, uh, once I discovered yarn stores and like sock yarn, like German sock yarns that are printed to create patterns, um, yeah, printed self-striping sock yarn, I also really enjoy. And then I discovered hand-dyed sock yarn, hand-dyed self-striping sock yarn. And uh, yeah, so I have a lot of socks to show you this week because um, I got really excited by a bunch of yarn that, that I got or was in my stash. And so I started a whole bunch of projects like, um, yeah, so I just was good at like finishing a, a couple things, a couple of big projects. Um, and I even picked up, uh, something that I haven't really touched since we came back from Mexico. And, um, but then I was like, Maybe it was just I wasn't knitting something that was satisfying or just maybe it's a little, I don't know. I haven't been able to like focus on a project. So I started a bunch of stuff. So here we go. Um, I'll show you what I picked up. So I started this Islander sweater. This is the Islander pattern by Skein Deer Knits. And I remember seeing like, maybe it was for her test knitting call or um, she first showed off this pattern and I like waited for it to be finally released. I think maybe when she was knitting the sample or something. And, um, and then I sort of figured out what in my stash would work to you to work with this. Um, and, uh, got the contrasting color and then yeah saved it for when I was gonna be uh, when we were in Mexico uh, to start it so and this um, is a steaked project this is a steaked pullover so there were steaks at which I've since cut open steaks at the arms and at the neck and it is a top-down construction sort of, uh, she kind of uh, follows the contiguous method or the ziggurats method. Um, and then I, she sort of developed this sort of short row shaping for the for the shoulders. So it's a um, an interesting construction method. And it's a nice like all over color work pattern that is like geometric. So it's easy to memorize and easy to see if you've made a mistake. Um, and I'm knitting this. The gray is a super wash yarn that, I've, that I uh, have had in my stash for a little while. It's a discontinued yarn. Um, it's a Dale of Norway uh, Baby Oul. Um, in, I, the, I think it just has a color number. And um, as, and it's a super wash yarn. And then the contrast color that I have, the contrast color that I have is a Pip Colorwork. 
um, by Ba Ram Yu that I picked up at uh, one of my local yarn stores here in Edmonton. Um, and yeah, it's this great dark teal and it's a it's a very nice yarn it sits very nicely with the other fingering weight that I have but the reason this sat around for a little while is because of the super wash of this gray yarn which is the main yarn in this I was unsure how to reinforce my steaks so um I was gonna like machine sew it or but I'm not I don't know I, I'm, I'm sort of resisting so getting out the sewing machine these days. So, um, and I, like, I wasn't so sure about machine sewing a knitting, a knitted item. Um, so then I was gonna, I was looking at like hand stitched reinforcements, but the instructions that I saw, they just seem to like go around and loop around what's there and I don't know that it's that different from just doing like a crocheted steak, which I wouldn't think would be advisable. Like that's not enough necessarily for a super wash yarn. So what I, um, when I was on a Zoom call uh, earlier in pandemic times, um, somebody suggested that I needle felt it. So I ordered a, a needle felting tool and that's what I did. I got here and I finally stabbed it a bunch of times the other day. Can you see it's all fuzzy on the back? The front looks kind of the same, but the back is all fuzzed up. And after, after needle felting it, um, and then, yeah, like stabbing it a bunch of times uh, into a piece of foam and then cutting it open, like it hasn't moved from where it was. And it hasn't added like a lot of bulk to the steak. So um, yeah, I think I think it'll work nicely. It's a nice a, a nice way to work with the superwash, and like yeah, the superwash felted with the with the needle felting tool just fine. So yeah, that's yeah. And I'll probably stitch down the steak once I'm done. So yeah, I'm part way down the sleeve, and um. I've been trying to, on this sweater, I've sort of, um, I've been using uh, a Norwegian colorwork thimble, thimble, which helps you carry both, like, strand, both strands on one hand. So I've been, as I typically knit continental, I've been using it on my left finger. And then like, but you know, every time there's a, a row where uh, there's like a couple rows in here that are just like the main color, um, that I end up taking the thimble on and off a bunch of times and like adjusting it. So I was trying to see if I could figure out how to just strand, like have them stranded over my finger without the thimble. Cause it feels like a little extraneous. Um, but I haven't like, for me, just the way that I knit and attention my yarns, they always seem to slip, this two strands kind of slip together. Like I can start out with them at a nice distance from one another on my hand, but they just, as I knit, they kind of just creep, creep next to each other on my finger. And then they're like this, and then it's super annoying to try and work with. So, um, yeah. While I would like to work without any kind of hardware, um, so far the hardware is giving me a better tension. So, and I, uh, I am, cha I have changed the the sleeve a little bit. I I think because my gauge is a little bit different from uh, Ellie of Skein Deer Knits, uh, so I had to change. I I like I first knit according to the pattern and like did all the decreases but and tried it on that's the nice thing at this stage I can try on the sweater um but it was far too tight and I even steam blocked it to see how much it would relax and it was still far too tight for my liking like this is a nice oversized fit uh a slightly oversized fit for the body of this and then to have like skin tight sleeves uh is not something that I'm really into so instead of she has a rate of uh pick up 
two for every three rows, two stitches for every three rows. So I've changed that to three out of four rows. So that picked up more stitches and um, uh, so I'm a little bit off book, uh, off pattern than, than what was there because I was already, to account for my gauge, um, I was already knitting the second to largest size um, and uh, the largest size was only like a couple of stitches off of what was in the original pattern. So, but I've sort of followed her logic of um, how many stitches there should be and like how the pattern should fall. So I think that's working out pretty closely to what, um, what was there. And I also increased the number of rows that I'm doing in between the decreases because it was um, the sleeve on me, again, I think because of our difference in row gauge, the sleeve on me, like all the decreases were done by here. So um, I've increased it by a couple of rows in, in between each decrease. So that should bring it uh, for closer down to my wrist, which is uh, something that I like for sleeves. That seems to fit a lot better for me. So yeah, but otherwise I am really enjoying this and um, I'll get to, I mean, I've sort of put it on pause a little bit this past week, I think uh, getting, because I just haven't been able to focus. I've been thinking about like starting a whole bunch of stuff. So, um, but I'll get back to it. It's, it's, it's enjoyable. Um, and okay, so let's look at some of the stuff that I, st well, some of the stuff that I <sighs> How about other things that I've picked up and worked on a bit, but not huge progress. This is my Earth Sea Stockbridge cardigan, uh, which is a pattern by Isolde Teague. And this one I am knitting out of Jam Jameson and Smith two ply jumper weight um, in the colorway 1280, which is this lovely, from a distance, it kind of looks gray. In some lights, it looks kind of greenish or purplish or bluish. Um, so I call this my earth sea cardigan, uh, because it seems like a magical kind of color. And this, um, is something that I've been using, uh, as something to knit while I do academic readings. I am a Masters of Library and Information Sciences student, um, and I study online, so I do much of my work uh, here at home. Um, yeah, so it's like having large swaths of stockinette is actually quite a, quite pleasing for reading and knitting. So that's kind of, it's coming along. I think I'm on my third ball right now, so that's coming along. And another thing that I've, that have had on the needles for a while, I can't remember when I started it. I don't remember if I showed it to you guys or not. Um, and that is my Ripple Bralette, which is a pattern by Jesse May Martinson, I believe. Um, and uh, a lot of people have, it's sort of, her patterns have been kind of, uh, gone viral I don't know it seems like a lot they're very popular and a lot of people knit them and um I don't intend to wear this as like an outer layer because I'm not comfortable doing that and uh I don't plan to wear this on its own as a bralette because I prefer having more support than that um on my boobs and this, I got to the point of needing to sort of try it on and test it. So I put it on waste yarn um, sometime last week and tried it on and I need to, I've got, I've got a full bust, so I need to have more length than um, what's written in the pattern. So I'm just gonna, I've done a little bit. This is sort of where my progress was, where my previous measure was. So I'm gonna do like another inch or so on top of that before um, decreasing. And this, I grabbed a skein out of my stash, which is a lovely ball of Ocean by the Sea yarn. Um, 
which she uses a lovely perfumed wool wash. Um, I presumably also like natural fragrances, so it shouldn't be problematic. I mean, unless you don't like smell smelly things. Um, and it smells very nice. Like where I have some of her yarn in my stash, it's just perfumed everything nicely. Um, I don't remember what this base is. I think it's just like a, it's a two ply. I think it's a non super wash wool. Um, and I believe this is the beachcomber color, which is her blue. Yeah, so that's coming along. And this is supposed to be like a one skein project. And oh, and like my intentions with this is to have it as like a warm underlayer to for the winter for what sometimes it gets really cold here. So it would be nice to have like kind of like a woolen undershirt kind of layer. And I might make another one of her little crop tops um, again, to have as like a woolly underlayer for when it's very cold. That can go over here. Um, okay, so now all the things that I've started. Parades of things. Shall I do them in the order that I started them? Maybe I'll do that. So, um, one of my local yarn stores just opened an online store, and so I ordered myself some needles but I got sent uh, the wrong size, which, you know, it happens sometimes. And um, so I happened to be near it the other day, and so I just went to exchange it and, you know, take a peruse through uh, what else they had on the shelf, including uh, they happened to stock uh, opal sock yarns, which I, I love a good opal. I think it's one of my favorite of the sort of mass-produced uh, German sock yarns because um, it does really great patterning and this I think was a color that I had seen on um, uh, Amy Beth of the Fat Squirrel podcast and that yeah is that focusing enough anyway so that's how it's gonna look and that's also like the color and <coughs> the color information and these are, this particular line is called the Frisch, Frisch Freund color uh, line. So I think it's just, they'll all have a similar pattern to that, but they just have different color combinations. And so um, that managed to also come home with me after exchanging these needles for the right size. <coughs> And yeah, so then I started them right away and then um, kind of put them down for a bit. So this is like the what my start progress had been for that day or evening when I cast them on. Um, yeah, and I'm knitting these on two millimeter, I want to say, DPNs. Um, I go back and forth between DPNs and Magic Loop usually one at a time magic loop. Um, I used to have a thing that like, if I was gonna magic loop, it would have to be two at a time. But um, since I've since changed my mind on that and I changed my mind about how I knit, how I knit socks uh, a lot. I like, I particularly like to try like new patterns and new heel constructions and stuff like that. And then, I mean, I do have favorites, but I do like trying out new techniques or new methods. Um, and then, yeah, to see how I like them. Um, and then this is a gorgeous, shade it from the sun, it's too sunny. The same blind problem that I had last time. Uh, they haven't, blind, new blinds have not been installed yet. Okay, so if I show it here, you can kind of see it. it. This is a beautiful self-striping, hand-dyed self-striping sock yarn that I got from the Yarn Badger. And this is their uh, Rainbow Cake colorway. And it came in this lovely, lovely wound skein where both ends were made 
were sort of tied with the same uh, little piece of string that was a contrast to the rest of the yarn so you knew exactly where your ends were to start. And um, so I started start winding from one direction and then I started winding from the other direction because I couldn't think of like what direction I needed like to get in the same, it's a rainbow, right? So I wanted it in rainbow in sort of typical Roy G. Biv rainbow order. So I, yeah, I started in, from one direction and then the other direction and then fin ended up picking one of those directions and winding the whole thing. And then when I started knitting it, I realized I had wound it in the wrong order. So it was reverse rainbow order rather than typical rainbow order. So my solution, um, I did not feel like winding the whole uh, gobstopper ball again. So I decided to make a pair of toe up socks instead. And I was planning to make a pair of Rose City rollers out of this yarn. Um, and uh, there is a, the designer, Mara Catherine Briner, has another pattern called the How, it's the How I Roll socks pattern. And um, where she does, it's sort of a, it's, it's not sort of your typical pattern. It's more of like a collection of different methods of doing toes and heels and cuffs. And it has instructions for top down and toe up. So it gives you sort of the different elements for each. Um, so, and one of the heels is a, a, t a toe up heel flap and gusset. So that's sort of the options that I'm going with. So I started with her square toe, which uses a, Oh, does it call for Judy's Magic Cast On? I'm not sure. I like Judy Ma Judy's Magic Cast On, so that's sort of been my go-to. I mean, there are, I I was talking with a friend of mine the other day, and we were talking about how, like, there's, there's about 50 different ways of doing anything in knitting, like doing stuff on the computer. There's 50 ways of doing anything. So, um, yeah, but, and like a lot of people default to what's the most popular, but I mean, there's other methods too that you might like better. So it's worth investigating if you're curious, in my opinion. Um, yeah, cause for a lot of years I used a Turkish cast on, which was, um, uh, Turkish cast on, which is for a traditional cast on method for um, socks, for folk socks, that was used for a long time before we had Judy's Magic cast on. So, and I mean, they're, they're similar kinds of cast ons. And uh, yeah, so I'm again knitting these on DPNs, this time toe up. And these I am knitting, this I'm knitting on a uh, 1.75 millimeter needle, which is a, is a US double zero which is um, giving me a nice firm fabric without being too hard on my hands. And um, my mom has declared that she desperately needs these socks. Um, I don't know that she's getting the first pair, but I do plan, I'm, I mean, I'm plan these are gonna be shorty socks, so I'm planning to try and get two pairs out of the skein. So I might make her a pair with some contrast. I might do the like knitted tube and knit a tube and divide it up with contrasting heels, toes, and cuffs um, for the second pair. I don't know. Or I might not. I might just, you know, knit some other socks. I could just knit them sort of afterthought heel-like. And then, um, because you can never have met too many sock projects, in my opinion. Yes, there are other socks that I'm not even talking about this week that have been hanging around on the couch waiting for me to work on them for quite a long time. But no, I decided to, to grab in my stash this skein of Trekking XXL that my brother gave me that he had in his stash um, to make socks, uh, some socks for him. So this is probably a very old color of Trekking XXL. It is color number 84. Um, 
So, I mean, if it's something that you wanted to find, it would probably be something you'd have to find in like a Ravelry stash or a D stash somewhere. And I, as you can see, like I've been working on these socks sort of, I worked on them intensely for a couple of days with the, I, I don't know, some cockamamie idea that like if I knit them really fast, they don't really count as an extra project. But I mean, that's just dumb. So I've gotten to just starting the heel flap on the second sock. And like this entire sock does not repeat. Like how insane is that? Like this entire sock is not even the entire repeat of the yarn. And it only starts to repeat, like I can, can kind of line it up here. Give me a second. Yeah, it this like this is where the repeat starts again like over the entire sock so that's like half the skein is one pattern repeat that's insane not like that's like I mean that's sort of similar to the Arnie and Carlos um perfect socks are like that too right where like basically the entire repeat is one sock so but this is you know years before that happened so um, yeah, check out the Trekking XXL for crazy, non-repeat, not, very seldom re re repeating. So, I had already knit, by the time I realized that it had started repeating again, um, I had knit a fair portion of the sock, so I decided not to go back and actually make them match. Although they're, like, nearly matching anyway, so it wouldn't have been wasting that much yarn. I don't know. I'm now way too far to be ripping out and making it match. I'm pleading. I'm I'm being the lazy knitter on that one. And then that's not even the last thing that I kind of started. Because I guess swatches don't really count as a new project. I don't know. This logic is not really holding for me, but um whatever. I do what I want. And yeah, yesterday I wanted to swatch. Um, so I had bought these two lovely colors of yarn from the Alberta Yarn Project, um, which is no longer uh, in operation here in Edmonton. And um, so, but I mean, I had bought this before they had sort of called it quits. Um, and this is, as you can see, Heirloom Lace Fin from 2018, um, which is um, from a flock of fin sheep that graze in a specific part in Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta, which is nearby here. Um, and then is, I think, I think it was spun probably at Custom Woolen Mills um, as well. And then these are naturally dyed. And both of these were dyed with tansy, which is um, sort of a local, I don't know if it's a native plant or an introduced plant, but it's it's prevalent in Alberta. So that's what these are dyed with. This one's probably modified with something to make it green. Um, yeah, so I had bought these colors with the intention of using them for uh, the Marit cardigan from Lina Magazine, issue number seven. Um, and I've been looking for the right contrast color to go with these. That's originally why I had bought this Jameson and Smith two-ply jumper weight, but then looking at it, with these, I wasn't sure that there was enough contrast between the green and this blue to really make it work, that this would be the main color. And then I got a skein of this Rama Phenol PT2 in one of their new Heather colors. Although it's a very, it's a very similar kind of blue, like ice blue. It just doesn't have the green or purple overtones to it. Also a very nice color. Um, so I decided to swatch with that and you can see this is where I started down here and there is like terrible contrast. I swatched with the phenol, with the, the, the Rama phenol 
and like there's can you even tell that there's three colors down here like seriously um so then I was like th looking at this watch I was I didn't even bother um doing the whole pattern repeat I was like okay this is obviously not gonna work so I grabbed um, some uh, cream tuku wool that I happen to have in my stash, which is actually the called for yarn, um, although not a called for color in this pattern. And um, I switched to that. And I also switched needle size to a little bit larger and I'm like, and I like this a lot better. So, I mean, for me, there's, there's two things that I wanted to know from this swatch. Uh, one was, are the colors gonna work? Which down here, obviously, nope. Um, and then the other thing is to swatch for gauge. And like, well, I guess there's actually three things because you have to see, you have like, I have to decide, do I like the fabric that I'm getting? So down here, I had knit with a 2.75 millimeter needle. And up here, I was knitting with a three millimeter needle. And I like this fabric a lot better. And um, the pattern wasn't super clear as I was knitting it, but after steam blocking it, it looks a lot better. This, the yarns have nestled into each other nicely. So I think I will continue with that needle size. Um, I'm not quite on gauge with this. I'm about two stitches off. So I will do some calculations to see what that means for my stitch count and what how that'll affect my ease. Um, and somebody asked me to sort of explain how I adapt for gauge like that and do the gauge that I want to do instead of what's listed in the pattern. And I think I haven't, I haven't sat down and like planned it out, but I think that's something that needs to like be its own video. So, um, I'll try and work on that to try and figure out how to explain that in a clear way. But basically like if you like the fabric, but you're not exactly getting the gauge that's in a pattern, it's especially helpful if you're in the mid range of that pattern, like if you're knitting one of the middle sizes, um, to be able to either knit a tighter gauge or a looser gauge and still use those instructions. Um, there is like, depending on how the pattern is written and what the shaping is like, can be easier or harder to do that. Um, but I mean, it's possible. You don't always have to agree with what's written. Just like, I mean, a pattern is a pattern, but you can, you can decide to change things. Like if it says twisted rib and you hate doing twisted rib, then don't do it. Right? Like it's your knitting, you get to be the boss. I mean, it will affect how it's going to look and maybe a little bit of how it's going to behave. But again, that's something you can test on a little swatch to see how you like it. And if, um, if you're really worried about it, you can sort of use the information from that swatch to decide how you're going to proceed. So like if, if your gauge is a little bit different on the ribbing, then maybe you adjust your needle size so that it has a similar effect, or maybe you just, you sort of go with what you were originally, like the needles you were originally going to use and get a slightly different effect. Those are all decisions that you can make individually as a knitter. And like being able, some of that is like, comes with experience of making things. And um, sometimes you have to just like, sometimes you just knit a sweater and it doesn't work out. And like, I've knit some bad sweaters. Um, I knit a sweater and had, and it was a pieced sweater and I was on gauge, but I didn't read the schematic and the armhole was way too small for me. So I didn't realize until after I had finished the entire sweater, blocked it, seamed it, woven in the ends, and then tried it on and it did not fit at all. And I kept that sweater for probably six to eight years just like never wore it, kept it because I liked, I really liked the yarn and someday I was gonna unravel it, um, but I never quite got around to it. And like just last year, I had one, when one of my cousins was over, I had her try on the sweater. It fit her very well. And so I gave it to her. So the frustration of uh, the bad sweater and like, 
I don't know. I kind of, I have this theory that like knitting sweaters or knitting anything is kind of like, um, learning how to improvise in jazz. Um, I heard a musician say once that you have to just get all the bad improvisations out of you, um, to get, to let the good improvisations come. Uh, so maybe you just have to knit out some bad projects. Like you just have to, like, if that hat is just not working out, just like let it be and then just start something new. But you got that bad hat out of your system and you can move on to something else. And that, just because it doesn't work for you doesn't mean it won't work for somebody else at a different time. So that's my, that's, that's a philo philosophical knitting thing that I have. But yes, it can be frustrating to put in all the effort to knit something and have it like really epically not, not fit. Um, which is why like I knit that sweater I knit the entire sweater and then um, kept it for so long because I didn't want to deal with it um, one way or another. I didn't want to get rid of it and I didn't want to um, put in the effort of unraveling the, the entire thing. Yeah. Okay, last thing that I also started since last time because it arrived the um, supplies arrived in the mail. I'm gonna take this off so you can see it a little better. And I'm gonna show you, this is a like a mystery stitch along from the Frosted Pumpkin Stitchery. It's their Chinese Zodiac. And I'll show you cause I'm, I just like, I think this is part of like the first set of instructions that came out many months ago. I am late to the party on this. Um, and I haven't stitched a whole lot, but here we go. So it's sort of the part of the corner motif <coughs> I've been working on. I've stitched this a little bit, not a lot. I haven't done a lot of stitching. One of the things I did do, I have started doing with my cross stitch pieces is when I cut down the piece, I've started instead of like getting out the serger, which again, like setting up a sewing machine for me, is like too much friction to actually do. So what I've I've started doing is I just uh, do a hand felled seam um, in the style of Bernadette Banner, like a little hand rolled, and then using a fell stitch to stitch it down, which um, is very pleasing to do. And it doesn't take that long. I mean, it takes longer than doing it by machine, but. Uh, It, it, it has less friction to, to start doing it. And that's about all of my crafting that I've done in the past little while. Um, books. I did not finish uh, Know My Name by Chanel Miller. Um, I got about halfway through before it had to be taken back to the library. So I've, you know, marked my place. Um, I know where, I know what page I'm on. And so I'm on the list to get it out of, from the library again. And it is extremely well, well written and uh, very interesting to read. Um, yeah. And yeah, so, so far in the book, uh, she testified, I think at a preliminary hearing And then it talks about, um, she goes for like a summer program at the Rhode Island School of Design at a printmaking, takes a printmaking class. And so it talks about her experiences of being sort of alone in Rhode Island for the summer. Um, yeah, which is interesting. And uh, the other book, what it, Oh yeah, the other book that I'm reading right now that I started is an ebook, and it is The Buried Giant by Kazuo Ishiguro, who is the author that wrote Never Let Me Go, which I've seen the movie, um, and then I read the book, and the book is beautiful. Um, this author also wrote Remains of the Day, which is a very old movie that I've seen. I haven't read the book. Um, 
which was also very good. And so this book, I think like each of his books are quite different from one another. And like Never Let Me Go is sort of in this future space, future time, um, but still kind of a kind of a love story, kind of not. Um, kind of coming at coming to terms with uh, one's own existence in a world where um, there are sort of genetic clones uh, raised for the purposes of in case their genetic um, partners need uh, do our organ donations. Such an interesting proposition. Um, yeah, so this particular book is not like that. It's like a fantasy story so far. We're in a world with ogres and dragons and, and like, there's like, there's this lack of memory that just everybody just kind of for has forgotten what's going on or like can't remember everything. And so we're following this couple who are going to visit their son who lives in another village, but like they, they only have like an ink, they only kind of remember that they have a son and that he probably lives in this other village, but they don't have a solid understanding of what that is or what that's going to be like. And yeah, so it's kind of, it's weird in an interesting way. Like, yeah, so we're sort of on the journey of getting them to that village. And I, I imagine we'll probably be, like the whole book will be about the journey and the people that they encounter on the way. And there's sort of these two different groups. There's the Saxons and the Britons. Um, and the Britons are Christian anyway so there's like conflicting of different cultures um and superstition yeah weird but interesting like it, uh, i you don't really know what's going on i don't really know what's going on yet and but i'm still compelled to keep going so i hope that i finish that one in time um yeah because yeah it would be weird to just be like halfway through the book and have to return it again I hate when that happens. Um, yeah, so I guess that's it for this time around. Uh, you might have noticed I made a little vlog. Um, it's very short. It's like not even two minutes um, of footage from some footage from pottery class, which um, somebody asked me uh, to vlog more because I do lots of different crafty things. And, um, vlogging is hard, like, to think to, to film things. It's not something that's in my habits. Um, although I, I guess I should get in the habit, get in the habit of doing it more. Um, yeah. So I have, to, like, and it's hard to film when you're at a class because, like, you're trying to spend your time working on what you're doing. I did, I'm, my mom was sort of uh, the, at our last class, she had a little minute where she wasn't really doing anything. So I just asked her to take a little bit of footage of me at the wheel. But, um, yeah, it feels awkward to ask other people to film you, um, or take pictures. Um, yeah, it's not in my habits to do that sort of thing. So I guess, yeah, I'll figure that out. If that's something that you're interested in, yeah, I can do more of that. So that's um, on the channel somewhere, and it's just a little short thing. Um, yeah. And yeah, I uh, also will work on this video talking about, talk, trying to give a bit more detail on how you can uh, basically knit at a different gauge than what's in a pattern. Uh, yeah, I'll have to sort of write, I think I'll just, yeah, write out a script for it or something. That's probably the best way of doing it. Anyway, um, thanks for, thanks for hanging out with me. Um, yes, I, I suppose I should do this at the beginning, but like, <coughs> thanks for sticking with me. Uh, thanks for checking me out or like subscribing and commenting. I love that. Um, 
I get excited every time I see and somebody else has viewed my videos or has liked them or commented or subscribed. It's very thrilling to me. Um, at the moment, we're a small but mighty group. So I'm, I'm happy that you're here. I'm happy that me talking about my knitting is interesting to you guys. So yeah, thanks for, thanks for being here. And uh, yeah, I'll chat at you next time.